1992, the U.S. government issued a doctrine that we should all be low fat or no fat. And within 10 years, rates of diabetes in America went up threefold. Doctors have been telling you for years that you've got to cut out the fat. Absolutely nonsense. I think you'd ask me off camera, well, what has changed in two and a half years? I think that what's changed in my perception has been the incredible influence of the microbiome, this three-pound organism, uh, organ that lives within us, uh, that uh, in terms of so many outcomes for health and risk for disease. For 99.9% .9 of our time on this planet, we didn't have sources of carbohydrates. People say, well, give us this day our daily bread. It's in the Bible. We've always had bread. Not true. Okay, so I'm here with Dr. David Perlmutter. Uh, it's been about two and a half years since I was at your, your house in Florida. My feet have never recovered. <laughs> we ran barefoot. And uh, it was a really, really great honor to, to meet you then as it is now. And I'm so happy that... that I get the chance to talk to you again. Me too. And um, so I just want to recap and, and jog your memory uh, what you actually said two and a half years ago. Oh gosh. <laughs> Fat is your friend. You get into a state that's called ketosis. Good, good, good. Keep it up. Everything looks great, Olaf. Just keep pushing Excellent. through. Excellent. You can take this to the bank. Olaf's going to validate the whole notion of a high fat, low carb, ketogenic type of diet. In 1952, my grandfather qualified for the Olympic marathon. He did it in a time of two hours, 40 minutes, and 41 seconds. Now, I'm on a quest to match his time and hopefully break it. Now back in 1992, the US government issued a doctrine that we should all be low fat or no fat. And within 10 years, rates of diabetes in America went up threefold. Doctors have been telling you for years that you've got to cut out the fat. Absolutely nonsense. Olaf has adopted this incredibly powerful lifestyle and dietary program, really mimicking what humans have eaten for a couple million years. And when you look at the metrics, as demonstrated from his work up at the University of Florida, it's over the top breathtaking. He's got this incredible physiology now, really based upon this dietary shift away from carbohydrates and favoring dietary fat. Everything lands or loads very nicely. Very efficient running. Your metabolism looks great. Okay. Three, two, one, and let's bring you down. Okay, he's hanging on. How hard Woo! were you working? How hard were you? Olaf has done a great job with his conditioning and his nutrition. Your maximum heart rate was 192. So you've got perfect heart, no indication of any heart disease whatsoever. You exceeded 70, which is, is quite astounding. That's fantastic. For 99.9% .9 of our time on this planet, we didn't have sources of carbohydrates. People say, well, give us this day our daily bread. It's in the Bible. We've always had bread. Not true. What really surprised me is how long you were able to hang on to using fat for fuel. We know that Olaf's eating a lot of eggs, 30 to 40 eggs per week. <laughs> eggs contain saturated fat. We've all been told to avoid saturated fat and nothing could be worse for us. We desperately need saturated fat. Thank you for watching my short film and I'd really be excited if you could help me finish this project. Take the sugars and carbs out of the human diet revisit the idea that we need fat and we'll once again experience good health. You made the statements in there, fat is your friend, take the sugars and carbs out of human diet and we'll revert back to good health. It seems to me after reading uh, not only Grain Brain but Brain Maker and then uh, attending your lectures here at the symposium that that 
uh, low carb, high fat is still like the cornerstone of what you do? It is, and I think that what we're leveraging now is not just the notion of lowering carbohydrates and simple sugars and adding in more fat, but the big thing we really need to push now is fiber, oddly enough. Okay. And you know, the average American consumes about five grams a day of prebiotic fiber. It's been estimated that our Paleolithic ancestors consumed as much as 125 grams a day. The reason that's important is because now we're talking about nurturing the gut bacteria. Mm -hmm. And that has really taken center stage. That, yeah, a higher fat diet, low carb is good for the diversity and the complexity of the gut bacteria, but that we've got to nurture them by giving them good levels of prebiotic fiber. And when you don't do that, even though you may be eating higher fat and you're in ketosis and keeping your carbs low, still you may start to gain weight despite how much exercise you do get or don't get. But if you don't pay a lot more attention to the microbiome, it'll still pave the way for not being able to realize your goals. Okay. Chris, now I just want to tell you what's happened in those almost two and a half years. Uh, sure, obviously the movie was about running and trying to chase my grandfather's best time. But I realized soon after that long distance running was probably not a good healthy option to be engaged in. So I stopped and that's why the movie never eventuated. But the, the, the thing that's happened in my physiology since has been quite astounding. Um, I had a body composition done at the University of Florida and I was just under 12% body fat. Just uh, seven days ago, I had another body composition scan and I'm now 8% body fat. And basically the stats is I've lost three kilos of fat and gained two kilos of muscle. I'm starting to see that metabolism and, and now you and you as work on the gut biome is what we need to get in order. Without Then doubt. we can become fit. Yeah. yeah. Let me just take it back a few steps. And we are trying to emulate what our Paleolithic ancestors would have engaged in in terms of their lifestyle choices, including diet and even their activity. Uh, our Paleoanthro ancestors didn't do a hell of a lot of work. They would, um, you know, this notion of working from dawn until dusk in the fields, that's brand new with agriculture just 10,000 years ago. Uh, we spent a lot of time in our Paleolithic times uh, not doing that much, you know, uh, Having a kill provided a lot of food, a lot of calories, a lot of fat, or finding a kill or, or you know, finding food on the ground. So um, your body has undergone a dramatic change having suddenly gone from you know, one profound extreme training for uh, this marathon uh, to very little uh, caloric expenditure at this point. And that's going to have a, a significant effect on your physiology, on your metabolism, but also it's going to change your microbiome. So high level exercise leads to an adaptive change in the diversity of organisms that live within you. It's measurable. You can look at the microbiome through fecal analysis of high level athletes during the times that they're in vigorously engaged in exercise and during the times that they are not and there are dramatic changes. The, the organisms and their diversity influence moment to moment the, uh, whether you extract more calories from food or you don't. So they are uh, influenced strongly, obviously by your food choices, but more important, not more importantly, but equally importantly by your level of activity. This is a, you know, uh, uh, we're looking at outcomes based upon multiple influences, not just diet, not just exercise, but looking at these things through the lens of the microbiome, through the lens of the gut bacteria. I think you'd ask me off camera, well, what has changed in two and a half years, and you actually mentioned on camera. I think that what's changed in my perception has been the incredible influence of the microbiome, this three-pound organism, uh, organ that lives within us, uh, that uh, in terms of so many outcomes for health and risk for disease. Okay. So where does uh, my experiment have sort of centered around being in, in ketosis and, and um, trying to maintain a high level, even to the level where uh, therapeutic ketosis, having higher ketones and blood sugar, where do you see ketosis or ketones specifically fit in with your gut biome? So what do we do? What do we do with a woman, then, a person, who has these interesting findings and has a movement disorder? On a gluten disorder, we put her on a gluten-free diet, low-carb diet, 
high fat diet, high preservatives, fermented foods, vitamin D, probiotics. What an idea for a woman with a neurologic problem. Her arms are moving all around. And I mentioned in the previous section, and Olaf, I'm glad that you're here because it reminds me to mention this again. When we say gluten, uh, when we say low-carb diet, we're also saying in the same breath, high fat. Yeah. And the, the reason we're trying to push that is we're trying to push uh, not just getting rid of, of the carbs to reduce glycation proteins, which, oh, I might add, glycated proteins also threaten the uh, integrity of the epithelium, gut epithelium. But we're doing that to push her into a low rate of ketosis. And you're familiar with that a ketogenic diet, which used to be reserved for children with intractable epilepsy. We're trying to increase the availability in her blood of something called beta hydroxybutyrate, one of uh, the keto acids that is used as for beta oxidation as a fuel. Why? Because research shows that uh, beta hydroxybutyrate actually reduces the activity of what is called the inflammasome. The inflammasome is this collection of pathways whereby uh, pathogen associated microbial peptides and damage associated microbial peptides stimulate those receptors, funnels through, turns on NFHB, and explodes. Uh, cytokines and inflammation in the body. That's down-regulated dramatically by beta-hydroxybutyrate. Beta-hydroxybutyrate you're going to get when you cut your carbs and, in addition, amplify them by using uh, sources of, of beta-hydroxybutyrate uh, like coconut oil, which is you know, the use of, uh, of, this, of this pathway of coconut oil in neurologic conditions. In fact, that, that's just been recently published, if you're familiar with this research, right? just published about 3,000 years ago in a beta text. Talking about, did I talk about it earlier? No, I don't know. Anyway, so that's old news. Vitamin D probiotics. And uh, I think that it is one player, but I think that we have to look at not just one entry point. Uh, you know, that's how modern medicine is practiced. You have a blood pressure problem and you're going to get one pill. One problem, one pill. It doesn't really, the body doesn't work that way. A person develops high blood pressure or coronary artery disease or diabetes because of multiple influences and by the same token, to deal with physiology or aberrations of physiology, it needs a, a bigger approach, a more holistic body-wide approach. And I would say that uh, being in mild ketosis does emulate to a significant degree what our Paleolithic ancestors must have been like. But beyond the fact that you looked very specifically at carbs versus fat, you've got to now look at nurturing your microbiome. Mm -hmm. And that means the addition of uh, adequate fermented foods teeming with good organisms, but more importantly, nurturing the good gut bacteria with higher levels, much higher levels of what is called prebiotic fiber. Okay. And it seemed, it's funny you mentioned that because I've actually naturally uh, gravitated towards that Good. without really isn't that thinking, incredible yeah uh, and and less protein naturally right um, obviously I'm not doing as much as damage but but still I was able to gain muscle yeah and it's sort of like what's going on there's something else going on here than than, than just trying to build big muscles in the gym which I now see is a totally different exercise is a is really just a stimulant yeah once you get everything else in order would that be a fair yeah, and I think in, in looking back, you know, at the time you were train, training, you were, you know, you were probably extremely catabolic, and obviously, hopefully, because you were in ketosis, burning your caloric storage in the form of fat, but may have been uh, degrading uh, muscle as well uh, through gluconeogenesis to create glucose for fueling your body during your, you know, extensive training. But, you know, I hope in two and a half more years we get together again and see what is, uh, where your health has taken you. I think that you concentrated on a couple of important areas. Um, really the most important being the shift away from carbohydrate as a dominant fuel source to uh, allowing your body to naturally enter ketosis based upon your dietary choices. And now that we're looking at the idea of nurturing your microbiome, it's going to be very fascinating to see where that takes you. Wow. Was it? How's your coffee, by the way? Oh, my coffee is great. Uh, it has a little MCT oil in it, a little butter, and uh, I'm feeling ketotic. You know, it's 2016. Here we are drinking coffee with MCT oil, which is pure fat. And, and it's sort of one of the taglines on my website is Beyond Fat Phobia. Yeah. What I, I talk about. 
and uh, I really enjoyed your talk yesterday and you said, you know, if you sort of mention this sort of that you're feeding your patients lots of fat, you might as well pull up the stage. So she is sick, her belly is bloated, no doubt you might be thinking that she has SIBO and you're probably right. We put her on a low carbohydrate, gluten free diet with prebiotic fiber as well as fermented <coughs> foods that go through it. When I say low carbohydrate, what does that also mean? It means high fat. I'm giving her lots and lots of fat. Now, you know, there are a lot of medical venues these days, to this day, where if you say I loaded a patient up with fat, you probably a hook would come out and they'd pop you off the stage. Because fat is, of course, though we've been eating it for over two and a half million years, it's made up the, our primary source of calories. Suddenly, in the last two and a half decades, it has become the enemy of our health. What a perverse notion is that? It's, re it, it's crazy, but when you see low-carb diet, that means high fat. We're trying to nurture her microbiome, but beyond that, we're trying to nurture her mitochondria. Hey, I could be wrong. You could be wrong. Yeah. Uh, but this isn't a, um, a short-term kind of history that we're looking at here. Uh, you know, the, the test of the uh, efficacy of a higher fat, lower carb diet in terms of human survival has been going on for over two million years. This is a long-term study. <laughs> Very good. Great. Well, um, just one last question. I have an aunt with Alzheimer's. She diagnosed about five years ago. I can't even get her to look at coconut oil or, or MCT. What, if you had to say one thing to her, what, what would that be to try and Aerobic shoot? exercise. Right. So... Uh, we know that that is what we call an epigenetic factor. It enhances the uh, a transcription of a certain gene in the body that makes a chemical called BDNF that will actually regrow brain cells, especially in the memory center. So um, I'd like her to be low carb, uh, get rid of the sugars and eat more fat, and add in some coconut oil or MCT oil. But I'd say if not, at least 20 minutes of aerobics each day. Now she doesn't have to get her heart rate up like you did, yeah, yeah. but we usually target uh, in a very gross way a pulse rate of 180 minus a person's age. Great. Fantastic. All right, Thanks very much. Two and a half years we'll get together. Yeah, for All sure. Right. Thank You're you very best. much for your time. My pleasure. Thank you. This one's mine.